Times are a-changing. This is J.K. Rowling. She hails Labour's new transplant. Now, this was based on an interview I did yesterday with Lisa Nandy here on Talk TV. Uh, and essentially, J.K. Rowling says she backed, backs Wes Streeting's decision to continue restricting puberty blockers. Uh, she waded into the row on this. As we know, there has been huge criticism over this, just to bring you up to speed. So essentially, the last Conservative government said, we are going to ban puberty blockers for young people because we don't know the long-term effects. Many of these kids are confused. And this is based on Hillary Cass and her really iconic report that she, uh, she uh, wrote. Now, Streeting has faced criticism from in his own party over this move, with members of Labour's LGBT wing writing to him with concerns about an indefinite ban. Now, yesterday, Lisa Nandy said she supported Wes Streeting uh, wholeheartedly and fully. And then J.K. Rowling shared a video clip of that interview I did with Lisa Nandy here on Talk, and here's a little clip of it. Well, look, look Wes has said all, all the way through this that he wants trans people to be treated with dignity and respect and he wants to look at the evidence. I've read the CAS review and in it, it's very clear that there are serious concerns about the long-term impact of puberty blockers on young people. We don't know enough about the long-term impact on physical health, on mental health, uh, and that is why Hillary Cass reached the conclusion that she came to. I think it's really important in this debate that we have far more light, far less heat and take an evidence-based approach. I think it's really difficult to navigate. Uh, I, I think because, you know, we were just talking about the toxicity of politics and I think this has become a very polarised and toxic debate. But I think that West Streeting is absolutely right to say we're going to follow the evidence, we're going to do what we think is in the interests of young people um, who deserve far more support, far more help going through a very difficult time in their lives and implement the, the, that review, not just to protect people from from the potential harm that puberty blockers can do, but also to provide the support, the counselling, the help, the medical services that they need at the moment that they need it. Far too many young trans people wait far too long for that, as I know from my own constituency. And so I think on the whole, in the round, the CAS review is a welcome contribution. Interesting stuff. Joining us now is Tom Slater, editor of Spike. Good morning to you. Good morning. What do you make of this, Tom? It's a complete reversal, I think, in terms of uh, the guidance and policy from the Labour Party endorsing the Cast report. Now, obviously, as I said, Wes Streeting has then got kicked back from the LGBT Labour lot, saying they don't approve of what he's saying. But actually, you've got people like J.K. Rowling saying this is the right move. No, exactly. And Labour will be very happy with that particular headline, her hailing it as the times changing where Labour is concerned. And on the one hand, this does feel like a big shift. Now, it's worth saying that the Labour Party did endorse the Cast review when it first came out. But almost immediately after that, they kind of return to the same sort of trans activist talking point. So the fact that they're continuing this puberty blocker ban is certainly good. That's the evidence based position as much as anything else. But there are still questions about things Labour is pledged to do elsewhere, making it easier for people to change their gender, legally speaking, as well as banning quote unquote trans conversion therapy, which is a kind of euphemism for any form of therapy that doesn't just affirm a child in their own gender, which is something that Cass herself has also criticised this potential ban. So this is welcome, certainly, but I don't think it's quite the same. It's not quite the full kind of um, coming to common sense moment that we would hope it would be on the part of the Labour Party. No, let's just let's just backtrack here because emergency legislation was brought in from June the 3rd to September the 3rd and essentially mm -hmm. said no new patients under 18 would be given puberty blockers if they were experiencing gender dysphoria. This was the Department of Health and Social Care. And as we know, this is built on the CAS report. And what yeah. Cass said at that time was, this is all shaky evidence. The evidence for allowing children and young people to change gender is built on shaky foundations, i.e. this is ideology over clinical evidence. Cass went on to say, look, we don't have any long-term studies. And the first rule, the first rule of medicine is first do no harm. And that's, I think, what she was building on. And she then went on to talk about the reason that kids may want to change gender. She said, look, it might be due to trauma or neglect or abuse or low self-esteem. And she also highlighted the fact that children's brains are continually maturing and developing. And of course, those people who go on to puberty blockers may well regret it. Just in terms of that, why has Labour changed its position? Is this because now this is a party that is looking or trying to appear like a grown-up party of government? 
I think that's certainly part of it. I think the cash review was such a landmark and because it furnished people with all of the arguments, all of the evidence, all the lack of evidence in some respects, as where something like puberty blockers is concerned, they would effectively be posing as anti-expertise. It was it was incredibly difficult for them to hold on to the frankly quite deranged position they'd held up until that particular point. And I think particularly one of the most heart-running aspects of the cash review, and it points to something that many people have known for a long time, is that the vast majority of children who show up at gender services, um, if um, all things being equal, if they were allowed to go through puberty normally, would generally grow up to be gay or bisexual. So there is a very strong case here that by pushing kids down this medical pathway, you're effectively kind of correcting a lot of confused gay and bisexual kids. And I think West Streeting, for him to be attacked as he has been in recent days as a kind of self-hating gay man, for bringing in measures that would actually protect a lot of confused youngsters struggling with their sexuality, I think it's been particularly unpleasant. But it's still a question as to how far Labour will go in terms of moderating their position on this issue. It's a really good point. In fact, what Cass said was 97.5% of children seeking sex changes had autism, depression or other problems that you rightly point out. Just in terms of that, how much of a problem is this for Labour? Because I think for the majority of the public, they will welcome this. I think it's common sense and it's a really good policy. What does it do in terms of the internal politics for Labour, particularly with LGBT Labour? I think it's already been incredibly fractious. We've certainly seen them, and West Streeting in particular, take a lot of flack in recent days, um, sometimes from outside the party, but also from within it. It's worth remembering in their last leadership election, when Keir Starmer was selected, the vast majority of the candidates felt compelled to sign these crazy pledges saying that they would expel gender critical people, denouncing feminists as basically hate groups and so on, because they take a different view on gender. So it's going to be very difficult for them. Um, but at the same time, I think they've got more of an eye on the electorate at this particular point. They know that the public have figured out what was going on in these gender clinics, figured out what this ideology really means, and they're not going to have it anymore. And so while I think Labour, as ever, are willing to kind of put up with a fight internally if it means they can look relatively sane when it comes to the rest of the British public. Now, in the last election, immigration was right up there in terms of people's concerns, and of course that's why Reform UK got five members of Parliament, because they were very strong on immigration. Now, Labour has shelved a legal crackdown on foreign workers amidst the biggest rise in the population for 75 years. So essentially the party is going to delay the introduction of two major legal changes to require bosses to limit foreign labour. I don't really understand what the Labour Party is playing at here, because because when you look at legal migration, it was seven, net legal migration was 745,000 two years ago. It came down to 685,000. Then the Conservative Party put in various caps, and we know that that will then probably produce a reduction of about 300,000 people coming into this country. But very mixed messages from Labour here. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is something that's always been a massive gap in their offer at the election and since, which is they said election has been far too, um, immigration has been far too high under the Conservatives, we need to bring it down. The only really two policies that we'd heard about was these two things which have now been shelved, one of which was essentially stopping employers from accessing foreign labour if they broke employment laws, if they were found not to be paying the minimum wage, etc. And then another attempt to kind of link in law access to foreign labour with investment in skills, the argument being that if we're investing more in the domestic population, the need for those employers to go abroad will be diminished. It's not going to be in the King's speech. They're mm. suggesting it's something that might be for the autumn, but it doesn't set a very, um, doesn't certainly sound a particularly good note for those constituencies in which reform came second to Labour, where voters are going to be very concerned about this issue. Well, I would agree. And also when you've got 9 million people who are economically inactive and 5 million people on out-of-work benefits, surely the Labour Party should actually, or sorry, the government should now address that, shouldn't they? I completely agree. And you shouldn't be using immigration to mask domestic problems, which is what we've seen under the Tories for some time, whether it's worklessness or anything else. And it seems like Labour is set to continue that. So, so it's interesting talking about this tightrope that Labour is walking, because, of course, on one hand, they're talking about reducing immigration. Now they're in power. They're not talking about reducing immigration. Here's another thing that uh, there is enormous pressure over. And this is scrapping the two child benefit cap. There's a big story behind this, isn't there? Oh, absolutely. It's something which um, certainly a lot of Labour members feel very passionately about. Um, and it's something which is really dogging the Labour Party. They've said basically on the basis of their own sort of fiscal rules that it's just not possible. Starmer said throughout the election, I do not want to pledge anything that isn't actually deliverable. But it's something that you're seeing criticism of it coming really from the left and right at this point in terms of this policy, its effect on family life and also its effect on people struggling really at the lower le lowest levels of the income.
Can I just move on and talk about something else? Later on, I'm going to be talking to James Murray, who's Exchequer Secretary to the Treasury. They want to talk this morning about devolution. This is the, the government want to talk about devolution this morning. Uh, this is about a devolution revolution to boost local power. This is the brainchild of Angela Rayner, Deputy Prime Minister. Essentially, she wants to transfer more power out of Westminster into local areas. And she's sort of talking about those devolution deserts. And I'm, I, I'm using this as an example, but say Suffolk and Norfolk. She wants local communities to be more involved. What do we think about that? Well, it's certainly where the direction of travel is going, Tory or Labour, a lot of interest in devolution. I just think whenever you're having a conversation of devolution, you have to think about what the track record of it's been over the past 25 years. A lot of people are pointing to Manchester because of the fact that there they've been able to attract a lot more investment, more powers have been used to good effect. But that's not necessarily the picture across the country, even within some of the nations of the United Kingdom. So it's always going to be an attractive possibility, but I think it always raises questions as to is this just the centre trying to almost abdicate responsibility for developing these areas, or is it actually a genuine route towards But, but don't you think there's a real issue here, that all you get is more and more bureaucracy, more, more layers of management across the regions, across the nations, and all we're doing is making a problem even more expensive? I think that's definitely a problem. You just create a more localised sort of elite making terrible decisions. And also there's the democratic question. I mean, even in some of these metro mayoralties, the turnout is still low. I mean, even in London, it was 40 percent at the last mayoral election. So you've basically got people with smaller and smaller democratic mandates having more powers and making more decisions, which can't be a good thing. Now, obviously, Labour is keen to have some quick wins, and I noticed this morning that spiking is to be made a specific offence in the King's speech, uh, which will uh, be outlined later this week. It's one of more than 35 bills. Now, for those people who don't know what this is, this is where you actually put a drug into someone's drink or into their body through another method. The figures behind this are off the scale. There has been a significant increase in recorded spiking cases in London in the last few years. 13% increase in cases. This has quadrupled in the last few years. Is this a sound policy or is this an easy win? Well, I think it's as ever with these things, is this going to really tackle the problem that you described there? Or is it something that you get a quick headline for, you can bask in the, in the glow of doing a progressive nice thing, and it doesn't actually necessarily have an impact on the ground? That's the question that needs to be posed. But it's certainly a very serious issue and one that should be treated as such, I think. And tomorrow is the King's speech. Of course, we're expecting something like 35 bills from the government. That's a lot of bills and actually far higher than normal. What are you looking for uh, in terms of what they are going to unveil? What, what are you expecting are going to be the highlights of this? Well, I think what's going to be interesting is really what is going to be the primary sort of reaction. Because at the moment, I think there is this kind of essentially a level of goodwill amongst the country and also even amongst sections of the more critical media. But the more we hear about promises being shelved, if we're talking about immigration or so forth, the more that you kind of suggest that Labour aren't really going to learn the lessons of where they've gone wrong in recent years, I think that could easily start to kind of slowly catch up with the government in terms of what they're not doing rather than what they actually are, if that makes sense. So, so there are two things that I want to see. First of all is, what is GB Energy? How is that funded? How is that going to run? How is that going to affect our lives? I think that's right up there. But also, what are they going to do about the small boats? I mean, obviously, we've heard endlessly about this new border command. It seems that Keir Starmer is convinced that if you just, you know, put Yvette Cooper on the White Cliffs of Dover with some epaulette <laughs> on her shoulder, that that will sort absolutely everything out. Um, but as ever, it's they um, are great at kind of writing a press release, this Labour Party. We're going to set up border command. We're going to set up GB Energy. And yet the substance of what those actually mean often isn't properly articulated. So we really need to see that detail because these are serious issues, even if you think Labour have got the wrong answers to them. Is there a sense that actually reality has suddenly uh, arrived for the Labour Party because they have been in opposition for so long, they're now suddenly in government, and as you say, they've had all of these great ideas or great ideas on paper, and now they're in power, they have to affect them. Is there a sense of, uh, I suppose, imposter syndrome? There could well be an element of that. I think the way that they're trying to counteract not um, not meeting expectations or not being able to get a grip on government is making their ambitions incredibly low. I mean, that was their whole pitch in the election. We're not going to promise anything that we can't 100% definitely deliver. So I think that's really going to be the story of this Labour Party. They will do some drastic things that people will disagree with, but I think there will also be a sense of their own support is being a little bit underwhelmed by the amount of progress they can make and at what speed, I dare say. So in terms of the King's speech tomorrow, what mm. should people look out for? What are going to be the big flags? 
Well, I think the things that we've already heard about, I mean, it's quite clear that Labour wants to make a big splash on the question of climate, whether that's GB energy, whether that's the um, a lot of the kind of uh, revolution in sort of renewable energy that it is that they've been talking about. I think it's also quite clear that they want to make sure that the on the kind of economic question that um, the kind of investment they want to see internally brought about by liberalising planning and whatever is going to be front and centre of the political debate going forward. But as I say, I think it'd be interesting to see what makes the cut, what things which might have been a bit more uncomfortable for the Labour Party, whether it's about immigration or anything else, finds its way not into the King's speech because they'd rather just park that and almost pretend those issues don't exist. Tom, really good to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time. That's Tom Slater, the editor of Spike.